All right, everybody. Welcome. This is Project Herpetoculture Podcast, episode 65. I'm your host, Roy Arthur Blodgett, and I'm joined as always by the dashing, handsome, and charismatic Philip Leeds of Eritz Only. And we have an excellent guest today. I'm really excited for the show. It's going to be a good one. And before we dive in, I'm going to go over our housekeeping. And first, I want to give a shout out to Dylan and the Animals at Home Network for hosting our show. The GOAT. Also want to give a shout out to Charlie, Mr. Vernal Pools for editing our audio and providing our excellent theme music. And I also want to give a shout out to our sponsors. So we have Custom Reptile Habitats and they are makers of premium PVC reptile enclosures. They have Universal Rocks products and a whole bunch of other awesome products on their website. So if you're in the market for any of that and you're looking to make a purchase, if you do so through the link in our bio or description, We'll receive a small commission at no additional cost to you. And that's always greatly appreciated on our end. Uh, we also have cold blooded caffeine and they're roasters of quality coffees from all over the world. And um, they donate 5% of the proceeds from each bag of coffee sold to conservation and coffee growing regions where you can also find some really amazing herpetofauna. So if you're interested in trying out some new coffees from them, you should do it and use our code Project Herp for 10% off your order there. And lastly, we have Fairy Tale Dragons. That's Ron St. Pierre and Heather Moy. And they are doing some amazing stuff um, working down in Florida with Bearded Dragons and Blue Tongues and a whole bunch of other amazing herbs and producing some really fine quality animals. So if you're in the market for any of that, look no further. And um, be sure to give them a follow on social media because they're always posting interesting stuff. And um, yeah, for anyone who's interested in supporting the show directly with a tip or a donation, anything like that, we have our Patreon at patreon.com slash Project Herpetoculture. And um, we're slowly building that out. We're going to be doing some Patreon subscriber only um, live, live chats and some bonus episodes for those folks over there. So if you're interested in joining in, that's the place to do it. And with all that said, I'm going to pass it over to Phil to introduce our guest. Awesome. Thanks, Roy. You, uh, man, you, I feel like you're getting better and better at that. It's like the, it's like this, uh, seamless, seamless, seamless spe- spiel. Good job. <laughs> it only took 65 episodes, man. Yeah. Oh yeah. Only 65. Look, Hey, sometimes with repetition comes simplicity, bro. Um, there we go. Yeah. So, uh, our guest today is Jay Somers. Jay, thank you so much for taking the time to have a conversation with us today. We really appreciate it, man. Yeah, you're welcome. Awesome. Well, I'm really excited to dive into uh, all the stuff that we have to talk about. I know we've got a lot of things that we've been wanting to, um, we've been wanting to talk with you for a long time. And um, I know we have a a whole mess of topics that we want to venture into, but um, the way we want to start out the show is asking about sort of your herpeticultural origin story. How did all of this start for you? Um. I mean, I'm. It's been so long. I I couldn't tell you what the main catalyst was. Um, I can definitely pinpoint some traumatic events in my childhood that were pivotal. And mm-hmm. you know, I had a really bad childhood, and I think that like finding animals in nature uh, was kind of like my escape. Mm-hmm. Uh, that started at a very young age, like four you know mm-hmm. so i just always been into it you know that was the animals that i had in proximity to me um were you know reptiles mm-hmm. and amphibians you know uh, mostly things like garter snakes toads box turtles because i'm from the midwest originally so mm-hmm. um and ribbon snakes stuff like that so i was just uh very curious about them and like I said, I, I had, it, it was like my escape. So mm-hmm. I spent a lot of time alone as a kid and they were the things that I interacted with. Mm-hmm. So w- was there, um, was there a time at which, you know, cause I, I know you say it's kind of hard to pinpoint a time when it wasn't a part of your life, but was there a moment when the like herpetoculture went from being something that you did that was sort of fun, the escape that you're mentioning um, and then it, when it transitioned into something that you were doing as a, as a living, as a way of, of getting. Um, oh yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I so I grew up in Kansas city, mm-hmm. which is, um, you know, it was like always like a, a hotbed for mainly snake breeders back then. Um, like all the biggest, you know, colubrid breeders, 
and even Python breeders were all from the Midwest. Like, so I'm from a suburb in Kansas City called Overland Park. Um, well, I'm not from there, but I eventually made my way there. And that's the same suburb that like, you know, Bob Clark is from there. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, John Richardson who owns, uh, well, I don't know if he still does, but he used to own, uh, loggerhead acres and mm-hmm. he was like a big time alligator snapping turtle breeder over. He moved over to Missouri. Um, and then like all the mountain Kings, uh, tricolored Kings, uh, that kind of stuff was all huge when I was in, you know, a freshman in high school in like 88, 89. Uh, mm-hmm. So, you know, I kind of fell in with some of these people, uh, you know, looking back now as an adult, I'm like, Jesus, man, I must have annoyed the shit out of these guys. Uh, <laughs> yeah. they were all, there's a couple of guys that are like saints walking among mortals, you know? And, sure. uh, but uh, so, you know, nobody really made a living doing animals like that. The people that made a living were like the importers, like Louis Porras, mm-hmm. uh, Tom Crutchfield, those types of guys mm-hmm. that were buying animals and reselling them mostly to pet stores, you know, because everybody else was just a hobbyist. Nobody was, you know, buying a Lamborghini, <laughs> you know, with their yeah, sure. multi, multi-level marketing schemes that, that we have today. Um, so, you know, really when Bob Clark did what he did, that was probably what pushed it over the edge, you know, uh, mm-hmm. you know, and turned like breeding animals into a real profit. And then old school guys like Eugene Bissett at Ophiological Services, but, you know, it was like snake breeders, you know? And so in high school, you know, I, I would have graduated in 92 if I would have graduated. And, uh, you know, the big thing then was like tricolor king snakes, gray bands, stuff like that, you know? Mm-hmm. And so I had had a lot of that kind of stuff. And then I just woke up one day and I was like, what am I doing? I could only enjoy these animals at all. It's a job. Mm-hmm. And so I sold all of those and I bought a group of red eyed tree frogs out of Honduras. And red eyed tree frogs were really rare back then. Mm-hmm. And I bred them. Um, and nobody was really breeding those at the time. And so that was my first like introduction into making money. And so, but I still didn't do it for a living until about, well, I can tell you when it was, mm-hmm. when, when I, when I stopped working and went exclusively into breeding animals only mm-hmm. was the year before Rapashi's New Caledonian Gecko Symposium. So that would have been 2005. Okay. And yeah. I was doing a lot of construction and I'd been making a lot more money off of my animals than I was working. But the working with my hands was like a meditative thing. Uh, and so the guy owed me a ton of money that I worked for. And I was the last person on the crew. I was doing high-end remodels. And I just went to Tinley. Mm-hmm. The, and I, know it was, I know it was the year before Alan's symposium. So it was 2005. I went to Tinley that weekend. And I just never went to work again mm-hmm. for anybody. So it's amazing. So, yeah. I, I mean, I, I, my whole life, all I did was earn money to spend on reptiles, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, like yeah. Literally every damn dollar, you know? Yeah, it's kind of weird, right? Because I feel like, um, at least speaking for myself, uh, I, I, kind of grew up not ever thinking or having any inclination outside of a handful of random examples that there might be some career in, in reptiles, you know? Um, and, but I, you know, uh, I think it, it, it does appear to be changing pretty dramatically. Like there are more and more people who do this as a living. Right. And, um, it's kind of cool. It's, it's kind of like this, it's kind of a weird, uh, like sea change in that, you know, I, I have, I've had, young people like you know kids in their early teens reach out to me and say hey like i want to i'm thinking about like becoming a reptile breeder or a reptile person of some kind to like as when like when i get older doing it as a living like what do you think i should work with and all this like interesting kind of what, a funny what you love <laughs> yeah exactly yeah, right it's number like, one yeah, number yeah one thing. exactly yeah 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 just do it do whatever you want like whatever sounds cool to you go for it you know yeah. um but i think it's kind of cool it's it's such a it it's a it's a it's got to be a weird thing I, I would imagine like the longer you're involved in herpetoculture um and this might be something you can speak to but like the longer you're involved in herpetoculture 
the more like with how much everything is changing, you know, it's got to be kind of a shock sometimes to have seen it at such an early phase. Yeah, and now, <laughs> I mean, talk to, I'd love to hear a little bit more about what, how yeah, that I'm curious. I mean, I remember wild caught leopard geckos, you know, I remember when sulcatas right. were not a thing. I remember when, uh, like crested geckos were extinct. I yeah, remember, yeah. you know, yeah. like I remember when veiled chameleons were not a thing. And, yeah. uh, you know, you know, when they first started coming around, they were called Yemen chameleons. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And I mean, I, rem- I just, you know, it used to be the only way you could make money um, was like pretty large scale uh, colubrid production. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of guys doing that. Um, But like, and I love all reptiles and amphibians with some exceptions. I just don't care to keep like I can't ever keep a fat tailed gecko. I just I'm not into them. Uh, (laughs) There's there's some animals I'm not into. You know, I'm not against keeping large, dangerous animals at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've done Mm -hmm. it. Uh, When I lived in the Midwest, I had a large venomous collection, but they were all Mm -hmm. like, you know, arboreal vipers and small desert dwelling vipers. I, I, I was never really interested in, you know, the lapids, you know, and mm-hmm. I, I mean, I've had large snakes and large lizards and large alligators when I was young mm-hmm. and dumb. And <laughs> I don't think that people shouldn't be necessarily allowed to own them. I just think it's far too easy to. And I yeah. believe that, um, like the fact that you can buy a Cobra for $20 wholesale is kind of, you know, <laughs> yeah, 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 but and it's been that way forever. Yeah, and so and like you know the croc monitors are promoted as like a good pet. Uh, when oh, I know yeah. multiple people that have you know, had life threatening injuries, nerve damage, all kinds <laughs> of issues, bites from oh, those. Yeah. You know, like oh, yeah. I said, I, I'm I'm a I don't really subscribe to any tribe. You know, like I'm not really liberal. I'm not really progressive. I'm not really. Cons- I'm kind of a mix of all of those things, depending on what mm-hmm. the topic is you know but so i don't Mm -hmm. believe that people shouldn't be able to own retics i just believe maybe there should be some standards set but Mm -hmm. you know but yeah i mean that's crazy talk man it is crazy. (laughs) well you know what if we don't do something they're gonna take away our right to do it you know Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah florida Florida is an excellent petri dish for uh Mm -hmm. what happens when the wild wild west is unregulated Mm -hmm. uh the pendulum swings back hard you know but yeah. no, I mean, I've seen, you know, my, my, my main areas of interest have always been obscure snakes, rare and obscure lizards, mostly geckos. Um, and then, uh, like rare amphibians. I've always had a thing for newts and salamanders, especially cold water aquatics. And, you know, I, I watched all these gecko people that were around years ago, like just start dumping their stuff when the ball Python craze came. And I was just horrified, you know, Mm -hmm. that, uh, everybody was diving so hardcore into this thing, you know, getting, dipping into their children's college funds and getting loans from family members. And I'm just like, you guys, there are not, there's not like 20,000 people out there that want to buy $10,000 ball pythons, like endless amounts Mm -hmm. of them. Like, where are you coming up with this idea? And I watched that happen. And that that was a hit to uh like the the part of the hobby that was into more obscure stuff you know and then mm-hmm. uh and then once that kind of crashed the first time around cuz it's done this like cyclical thing um a lot more people started getting into things like dart frogs started keeping things that they enjoyed keeping it wasn't just for the investment potential mm-hmm. and you know i i see it kind of go back around 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 you know up and down you know um, mm-hmm. and I don't know. Now people are trying to make green trees and emerald tree boas the new, the next ball python, you know, craze. But yeah, I mean, I've seen a lot. You know, I've seen, you know, no internet. I've seen having to give presentations with slides. But the first time I ever gave a lecture, I was probably 22 at University of Nebraska. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it was a slide <laughs> carousel. And mm-hmm. if anybody's ever had to get slides developed, it's not the most fun thing. <laughs> I don't even know where you would do it now. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, and then uh, it's just interesting to see what's happened. Uh, 
with the hobby. And, you know, I, you're into your mastics and I'm like, I remember Randy Gray, like very, oh, yeah. very well. I used oh, to yeah. talk to Randy Gray all the time. Yeah. Uh, Doug Dix used to talk to him all the time. Uh, you know, and these guys that are like Noel and Claire Alt, mm-hmm. uh, which I don't even know what their company name is. You know who the Alts are? Oh, yeah, yeah. They're, I know. they're like yeah. out in Palm Springs. Well, you yeah. know, they used to be frog people. Hmm. They were the first people to breed. Well, I don't know this for a fact. I believe they were the first people to breed like budgets frogs. So they used to own a company called Hacienda Anura. And they bred like Pac-Man frogs, budgets frogs, that kind of stuff. And then they sold their company to Kim Thomas, who started Frog Ranch. You know, but now they do mm-hmm. Euromastics. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I've just seen a lot of that stuff over the years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, you, know, yeah. yeah. you know, five foot long Egyptian Euromastics coming in. I mean, they weren't five feet, but they're pretty damn big. No, they weren't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and then, yeah. you know, like Mollies, which I don't even see Mollies anymore, you know? Yeah, uh, yeah. Like amazing bright yellow Jet black, awesome animals. Oh, yeah. 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 So some something I'd like to I'd like to ask and maybe uh try to pr- try to pry apart a little bit more is is can you talk a little bit about like because I this is something where I have a I don't know. You, you know, you mentioned um being cool with people owning and keeping dangerous reptiles, dangerous animals, right? Mm-hmm. Like and and I go back and forth on this. There are times when I feel like no. There's no, you know, I don't, I don't really imagine why anybody should be able to have these things. And then there are times when I think, well, I also don't really think that I like my feelings should be influencing what other people can and can't do. And then I, you know, and then, but then I also feel like, okay, if, if I'm going to say like, you know, if somebody wants a black or monitor or a crocodile monitor or a retic or whatever, then okay, maybe people should be able to have them, but they should maybe they should have to jump through some hoops. And I'm I just agree. is that kind of how you feel? And I'm curious yeah, how absolutely. What, yeah. Okay. I mean, look, everybody starts talking about that like slippery slope. You know, it's like, okay, mm-hmm. well, Phil says he doesn't think that you should own a croc monitor. Yeah. But yet this person over here doesn't think Phil should own your mastics. You know, yeah, and they're so, clearly clearly wrong. Those losers. No, right. <laughs> what the hell do they know? Yeah, <laughs> goddamn mouth shut. No, but like, <laughs> so my my thoughts are, um, I do believe that there's not going to be a governmental mechanism to regulate that, right? Mm-hmm. There's no permitting system. That's, they're going to give you a license, like like a driver's license or a gun license. You know, it's just that's not going to happen. So it's going to fall on the community to self regulate. Right. Mm -hmm. And Mm. so and I don't know how you would even go about that without having some type of, you know, accreditation Mm -hmm. with an organization where you say, look, you know, this is our reptile society, whatever you want to call it. And if you want to be a member, then you get like an accreditation. And if you violate that, uh, Mm -hmm. our code of conduct, if you will, then you're out. Mm -hmm. And. The only thing that does is helps us save face a little bit with legislation. But, you know, mm-hmm. my my thoughts are if you want to own a retic in your home and you're responsible and it never gets out and your neighbors never know, then mm-hmm. I'm okay with it. The problem is, is that not everybody is responsible like that. So where do you draw mm-hmm. the line? You know, like, I mean, I, I live in California and I can tell you, like, things that irritate the hell out of me are... I cannot stand when people walk around with snakes in public. Oh, yeah. I cannot stand even when people walk around with a bearded dragon on the pier. Mm-hmm. I hate it with a passion because, first of all, not everybody wants to see your lizard or snake. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I'm I'm very conscious and respectful of people's phobias, right? Mm-hmm. And yeah. also, you're only doing it so you can get attention. Your mm-hmm. retic does not care. He doesn't want to be outside when it's 68 degrees on the pier. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, mm-hmm. like I have a large, scary, dangerous dog breed. I would never take my dog out in public and walk him around mm-hmm. just so I could get a reaction out of people. I can't stand that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's definitely it's definitely peculiar. And it, you know, I, I've I've talked about this I think a couple of times on the show, but I used to there there used to be a reptile shop here in Colorado that would they had um they had a couple of things uh, that they did, that I didn't like that they did. But one of the things they did is they had this massive black throat monitor just cruising through the shop. Like, and I mean, 
It's a liability. This was a, f- oh, 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 God. Like a, like a, like a deadly liability. Like, you know, somebody's little kid. They never bite until I mean, they do. Right. Yeah, exactly. It, I mean, that's, oh, dude. And it, it was a massive, I mean, you guys know, you guys both know better than most, oh, yeah. right? Like, it's a huge, huge animal. And the fact that that thing, I remember watching someone's little kid, like a little tiny four-year-old kid, pet that thing in the head and then walk away. And I'm like, it, it, it not, it, and I don't care how tame, you know, whatever, like do your either. work, tame it up. I don't care. I wouldn't be cool with it. My, with a dog, with somebody letting the, letting a little four-year-old just pet any random dog that they don't know, I let agree. alone a giant lizard. I mean, it's I so, so sketchy. And I, I mean, I feel like, um, you know, and I feel like it's one of those things where, see, I, I, I disagree to some, to some extent. I think I could, I could easily envision a, a permitting system or a licensing system that would grant people the right to, you know, keep and maintain something like a retic or, or, a, oh, I, a, I think they should. I just don't yeah. think the government's ever going to do something like that. It's too much work. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's the issue. Yeah, I it's mean, not that, yeah. I, I, I mean, personally, I, I believe that if you own a snake or any animal that can kill you, uh, you should be permitted. Yeah. Mm. But how many times have we seen people with permits do, do sh- really bad shit? Yeah. Constantly. <laughs> All <Yeah>. the time. <laughs> some, of the, yeah, some, some, sort of. some of the biggest names in the industry, you know, like I see a lot of shit. I don't like, I don't like the promotion of, uh, all Dabra tortoises. Like where the fuck yeah. are all, where the fuck are you people going to put all these damn old Dabra tortoises, man? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah I mean, I keep small, I keep small animals, you know, I'm just, mm-hmm. I don't have a desire to keep big smelly animals anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, what were you going to say, Roy? Um, oh yeah. Just that. I, I mean, I'm, I'm on the same page. I feel like there should be some sort of barrier to entry. You know, it's like, even, even if it's like on some level, like within, you know, self-regulatory mechanisms, it's like, even just cost on some level, should be more of a barrier with some of these species, you know, where it's right. like, it's like, you shouldn't be able to buy. Yeah. Like you said earlier, you know, like, a obviously you shouldn't be able to buy a Cobra for 20 bucks wholesale, but you know, like things like retics and, and, um, large monitors, stuff like that. It's like, it would be, it'd be nice if there was some sort of gentleman's agreement within the hobby. that was like, <laughs> you're not buying this above this amount of money, you know, and knowing right. that the person's going to have to have, like, if they've got sure. that kind of money, then they're, well, then they're it would be nice they if have they maybe the resources. Yeah. You know? Yeah. We don't frown upon it enough. Everybody's reactive. Like, look yeah. at this big thing with, uh, what was that guy's name? Uh, Samson Pruitt that went down like mm-hmm. a year or whatever. Right. Nobody complained about the snakes. They only complained about how they were kept. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's, Man, this yeah, brings up something. This, this is this is actually what you just said. Uh, it, it extends even further than that. Like, it is the weirdest thing in the world to me um, that we herpetoculture as like broadly. I, you know, obviously, I don't want. I'm trying not to generalize it about everybody, but I think this is true of of a lot of herpetoculture. Like, we there we almost never call out bad behavior. Like, no. and, and I mean, promote it. Dude, it's crazy. Like, and, and even simple stuff, right? Like if I, like it happened today, uh, um, I, there are a couple of people who very regularly, I get messages from customers of these individuals saying that they were sold the an animal that they didn't, that it wasn't one that they were advert. Like it's not the one that they were advertised. It's the wrong sex. Something's wrong with it. And like, they, they, they like laugh it off. They like, go ah, you know, typical, you know, typical reptile person. And I'm like, what? No. And, and, and I'm not suggesting that any of these people should go and call out the individuals. Right. Like, cause that's not, I'm not interested in calling out individuals. I'm interested in yeah, calling call out bad out behavior, behavior. Right. Yeah. Call mm-hmm. out the behavior. Right. But like the fact that these people will continue to be customers of those individuals from time to time and that they will not let, they like don't tell other people, Hey, this dude sold me a male when it was supposed to be a female, or this dude sold me an animal that was burned 
that, that he, he didn't tell me it had a big burn on its back. It's like, that's completely unacceptable. Like you wouldn't, you wouldn't get away with that. If it was a car dealership, you wouldn't get away with that. If you were a right. dog breeder, you wouldn't get away with that. If you were like a shitty restaurant, like if you go and get sick, people tell, uh, don't go eat there. I got sick there. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, man, it's crazy to me that we don't have like, you know, that there's not more of a cultural or, or a different example, totally for an example. And this one, this one goes years and years and years back, like 10 years ago, I bought a group of Egyptian Euromastics babies and um, it was like maybe five of them. And they came in the worst condition I've ever had any, any Euros come in to my place. Right. And I remember posting it in like a feedback forum on Facebook somewhere. And there was more than one person who attacked me and said, what do yeah. you expect? You bought this, you bought this animal from this place. And I'm like, are you missing the fact that you shouldn't be, it shouldn't be yeah. allowed out in any way that you do this? Like you, somehow it's my bad. Like, no, it's their bad for shipping an animal like that in the first place. It should never happen. Well, it should it's, never, it's, never, never happen. It's the mm-hmm. importer's bad and the hobby or pet trade, the retail pet trades, like major glaring flaw that we yeah. allow or accept that type of animal to ever be exported out of its country of origin in the first place. Yeah. Like yeah. the way that they maintain like uh, certain types of iguanas, uromastics, things mm-hmm. like that. It's not pretty. No. Tortoises too, you know, especially yeah. things like uromastics and tortoises that have a lot of meat on their bones that can go yeah. a while without eating. And then they just basically starve them to, to fucking death. Yep. And then they, they they get imported. And then the people that import them just sell them off before they die. And mm-hmm. yeah, that's that's that particular shift needs to happen very quickly. Because first of all, I've watched, you know, the number of countries diminish to like... Mm-hmm. A fra- like such a tiny fraction compared to what it used to be. Yeah. I mean, the the yeah. wholesalers are all gone. There's only a few wholesalers out there. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to name names. Sure, but, sure. You know, basically, it's like one person in Florida, one company in Florida, one guy in Texas, uh, and then, you know, one that's barely hanging on in California. And then there are all these peripheral people that are doing like smaller numbers. Mm-hmm. Uh, and not one of them has ever told one of the collectors in another in Indonesia or Egypt or Suriname or whatever, hey, don't send me shit like that ever again. Yeah, yeah, yeah for yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah. nobody, can, yeah, they're like, whatever. Yeah, well, like, you know, I'm going to get in, like, I don't want to get too much into it right now, but like, that's part for of sure. what my talk is going to be. Sure. Just that I'm so sick and tired of the reptile trade Mm -hmm. treating animals like they're fucking bananas and apples and shit like that, where, you know, we got to sell them before they spoil. And if they go rotten, Mm -hmm. we just throw them away and we'll just order more, you know, Mm -hmm. that kind of shit. Mm -hmm. Like we don't, there's a lot of animals that just don't even need to be imported anymore. (laughs) Yeah. 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 For sure. Yeah. Um, Totally agree. Yeah, like tomato absolutely. Frog. Why the fuck do we import tomato frogs? They produce 10,000 eggs in one clutch. <laughs> yes. We don't need yes. to import white tree frogs or red eyes. Mm-hmm. But it's it's not there's a lack of incentive for anyone to cap to breed that stuff on a commercial level when these wholesalers refuse to buy captive bred babies and if they do they want to pay half the price of a wild caught. It, it's just this- nonsensical. Yeah. Is this like a chicken and an egg thing in some regard? Like, um, I don't know what the fuck it is. Well, cause, cause, because, <laughs> I mean, know? well, no, you, 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 you strike at, at, at like really at the heart of something that's like near and dear to my heart too, just because I'm producing, you know, like I'm at the point now where I can do things, I can do things well and I can produce somewhere around, depending on, depending on the season, I can get anywhere from two to two to 350 euros a year, yeah. you know? And, and, and the idea that, that I am competing constantly with these imports that people bring in and sell for half the price of the animals yeah. I produce 
and that none of the none of the of the wholesalers and retailers want to pay for premium captive bread. But even then, okay, it's like, well, then they're going to pass the buck to me and say, well, you should have a competitive price because I can get them for that price. It's like, no, you should be choosing to get the more ethically sourced, sustainable, yeah. healthy right. animal. Yeah. Right? And, and but I also get it. Like if if we're talking to pure numbers. I get that their bottom line is, is, is hurt if they have to pay for my animals as opposed to someone else's. Right. So it's like, I, I kind of, I mean, I see that, but I also feel that they could force the change. I mean, I'm I'm not going to get into your, your business and the way that Mm -hmm. you run things, Mm -hmm. but on my end, you know, uh, well, let's say I chose, I said, okay, you know, like, okay, like you're a Mastics uh, guy, right? right? Like the Nicaragua yeah. or whatever they are. The, the, uh, Niger- Nigerian. Uh, yeah, Nigerian. Uh, there's enough of those things around. You, Someone could commercially breed those and com- mm-hmm. and sell them for a competitive price. Right. Yeah, I've got a lot. I've got a lot of them. I mean, the damn <laughs> things are, they're less than a hundred, they're, you know, depending on yeah. what color, depending on what color they are, they're 50 to 60, 40 to $60 wholesale import mm-hmm. right right and i mean i don't i mean what's it what i mean do you what what would you typically sell a captive bread like red or yellow um, I, I usually keep them between two and 350 just yeah. depends yeah. yeah yeah i mean it's like i've seen a a, a massive shift in the consumer mm-hmm. yeah uh and their attitude towards things too they really are willing to pay more money uh, I can prove that because they come to reptile shows and buy the stuff. Yeah, yeah, totally. Totally. They're paying, they're paying the it, dollars. It's just that pet stores are stuck in this like mentality, you know, and they won't evolve, but they're all going to age out anyway. Is that what you, do you think it's going to be like, um, it, do you think that like the future of reptiles is going to look something like a, something similar to the future of dogs and cats and, and more popular um, or more commonly kept animals where like, the the your typical pet store doesn't isn't selling puppies anymore. It's selling food and collars and vitamins and water bowls and I, you know you know. I'll tell you where I live in Southern California. There mm-hmm. are a shitload of reptile stores. Yeah, and it's not like that. Like in Kansas City, there's no there's not. I mean, I can think right now from L.A. to the border. You know, in Southern San Diego, mm-hmm. I mean, there's probably twenty five to 30 exclusive reptile stores. Amazing. Mm-hmm. And I can tell you from going to them, a lot of them are making their money off of crickets and feeders like rodents. Totally. Yeah. 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 It's supplies, supplies. And so yeah. I don't know what I think is going to happen is, you know, these, these pet stores have all run out of, of, of variety to sell. Right. So mm-hmm. like, it's the same thing as like going to a reptile show. It's ball pythons, Crested geckos, leopard geckos, certain types of frogs, things like that. And, you know, the ones that are a little more specialized might have darts and some other more obscure stuff. But Mm -hmm. um, I I think that it's just going to be kind of a natural evolution without any real effort. Uh, Mm -hmm. Mainly, mainly fueled by the lack of, of wild caught variety being imported because, you know, Mm -hmm. when I was younger, it was like Madagascar, Egypt, Peru, Tanzania, Mozambique, you know, uh, Guyana, Suriname, mm-hmm. and, and you know, just but they were all coming in every week, and there was like ten shipments. You know, so there was Madagascar would come in every week to ten different people. Mm-hmm. Wow, yeah. Same with Egypt, yeah. and uh, yeah. so. And all that's gone. I mean, what are you getting now? You're getting like, you know, Tanzania's done. Uh, mm-hmm. Mozambique has like a few weirdo things trickling in. Uh, like yeah. those pseudo cordless came in, but I, I don't know what country, probably South Africa. South right? Africa. Yeah, I got um, some of those. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, um, but other than like special imports like that, as far as the commercial pet trade stuff, it's like Nicaragua, red eyed tree frogs, you know. And you know, green and black, green and black uh, darts, and then it's mm-hmm. like the occasional Egypt shipment doesn't even come in a couple times a year now. Uh, and then like Suriname, mm-hmm. you know, some emerald tree boas and some 
clown frogs and shit like that. There's just not a lot of import going on anymore. So it's just kind of yeah. naturally, but but it's not because they're making a conscious decision to modify their behavior. They just don't yeah. have a choice. Mm -hmm. But there's an yeah. opportunity there, I believe. There's an opportunity there for people like me to, you know, make some really good business moves. Mm -hmm. Because supplying supplying captive bred, uh, you know, product to these pet stores when they don't have that, like, look at Firebelly Toads. They just disappear. Mm. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, dude. Those used to be everywhere. Everywhere. Oh, yeah. My God. And they're gorgeous. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you know they. You can make you can make two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year easily breeding fire belly toads. You know, yeah. so yeah. I mean, well, there's so, just a lot of examples. The same thing happened with newts. All the newts just disappeared. Poof. Yep. Mm -hmm. Which mm -hmm. I'm happy about because the newts that were being put in pet stores were horrible pet newts anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, something that then, something that comes they just die. Yeah. Totally. They shouldn't be pulling things out of the wild just to put them in an aquarium so they can die. No. Yeah, That's agree. horrible. Yeah. I also feel like there's something in this too for me about like, like people should understand like the true cost of things, you know, on some level. And, and I think that like early on, earlier on when there was such great abundance, you know, you had all these shipments coming in, it made more sense for things to be priced lower. But in some ways it like, it kind of like set this expectation in people's minds. Like this is what this goes for. And in some ways it's like, it really probably should have never sold that cheap. It did oh, yeah. because I, there were I, that I, many of them, but like it really no should have never thing. been that cheap. Yeah. yeah. I, okay. So like, uh, I'm going to have to get some different lighting going on here. <laughs> That's okay. So, I'm pretty dark. Let me Sunset plug it. Here I'm I'm That's all right. Do you think it's hard to compare with Roy's, LED lit background there. He's got running nothing but Arcadia Luminize. Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't have any Luminize. I'm, I'm just, I'm just giving you a hard time. Well, this <laughs> isn't an audio only podcast, you know. That's technically uh, true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But look at like, um, we can talk about geckos, right? We'll talk mm -hmm. about like Tropio Colodi, Stenodactylus, um, Ligodactylus from East Africa. Mm -hmm. Those things were like a dollar fifty, two dollars. I think you're working with Skinkus, right? Like Sandfish. Wow. I, I am. It's a $2 animal yep. that most people are going to fail with. Oh, yeah. And yeah. just the fact that we even import things like that, uh, knowing that they're going to die or that mm -hmm. the majority are, it's disgusting to me. Mm -hmm. You'd agree. I mean, look at red eyed tree frogs, mm -hmm. arguably one of the most beautiful animals on the planet. And it's a throwaway oh, yeah. species. True that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they it's retail for $29.99 out here at pet stores. Yeah. That's gross. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. It's it's funny. That's been one of the main driving forces between some of the weird um the weird projects I've taken on over the last couple of years. It's just been like, man, literally anything. Like it does it at the end of the day, it almost doesn't matter what you work with in some regard. It's like just work with something, just give it the chance, just give any right. of it the damn chance, right? And and we had an interesting conversation edition with Josh Markey um, yeah, on the show Josh. several, like I think like a couple of months ago. Yeah. Um, or maybe it was last, well, just a few weeks ago, even. Um, <clears throat> and something that he brought up that I, I really appreciate a lot. And I feel like continues to grow on my mind as like a, maybe like a truism or just like a, a maybe a, uh, like a really viable perspective is like just, and, and I think it pertains to this part of this conversation, which is like, just charge more for your stuff, you know, like give, right. give things value, right? If you'd like if infusing them with value, whatever that means, like whether that's making it a weird looking one where it's an albino, whether that's, I mean, and we could get it a different discussion. I'm just saying as a, just as yeah. an example, right? Whether it's, whether it's simply valuing the, 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 the wild caught form as is, whether it's setting the example and saying like, okay, these sandfish might be two dollar wholesale imports. I'm not gonna if I if I manage to breed them, they're not gonna be any less than four hundred dollars a piece because they're worth it. They're weird. They're interesting. They're different. And I put the value on it. If I value them for that much, someone else will value them for that much. And if they're not, if it's not something cheap that someone can discard easily because it was just thirty bucks, 
right? It was twenty nine ninety nine, like your red eyed tree frog. Yeah, people and just don't care. Yeah, then they then they're gonna care more if it's dude. If it's a, I mean, are you kidding? Like, look at Skink Opus, uh, the Peter's Bandit Skink. When they oh, yeah. first started popping up, I had people in Europe begging me yeah. to buy them so I could put them in my export. They were like three thousand dollars. And now they're like twenty five dollars. Yeah. Wow. Look at Lagodactylus Williams eye, the blue gecko. The first mm-hmm. ones ever offered were like three thousand dollars for a pair. Damn. And then they got they literally got down to fifteen dollars a piece wholesale. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've seen it, and then what happened? It's it's unfortunate, but this is the case that if an animal doesn't have monetary value, it's just not if the they only place the monetary worth of the animal. They don't care about anything else. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's just a fact mm-hmm. that once an animal loses its value monetarily, people lose their interest in keeping it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, speaking broadly, obviously there's always yeah, that yeah. one person over it. Like I still breed dwarf clawed frogs that they retail at $3 a piece of Petco. Right. You know, I just do it because I like them and it's fun. Yeah. But you know, but for the most part, uh, once the price of an animal starts dropping, whether it's uh, Chinese, you know, like Shinosaurus, yeah, I watched. I watched people start dumping those things right before they went Sides one, and I was just like, "What are you guys doing?" Like, it's like once it, people are strange in this hobby. I'll just say that. <laughs> so, what do you think? What do you, What do you think the What's like a way of combating this? I mean, you know, because it, it, it strikes at the heart of one of the, one of the problems. A cultural we, shift. Yeah. It's cultural. Take, okay. Taking a stand mm-hmm. and sticking to it, which is tough. Yeah. It's really, it's really hard to force uh, these importers. So I can just use like, I, I, I hate to always just go back to these examples, but wise tree frogs, giant day mm-hmm. geckos. Look at Paralydura picta. Right. The oh, yeah. quota, I don't know off the top of my head what the quota for Paroidura picta is, but it's microscopic now, right? Mm-hmm. Like there are not very many. Mm-hmm. And far more are produced in captivity mm-hmm. than there is a quota for. Mm-hmm. Same goes for tomato frogs. Um, why in the fuck are we still importing these species? The quota for a giant day gecko is pretty small. There's no reason for us to import giant day geckos. There is mm-hmm. no good argument for it. Mm-hmm. And I mean, for fuck's sake, man, they're living in Hawaii. They're living in Florida. There's, mm-hmm. I mean, if we needed new breeding stock for something, which we don't, but let's just say if mm-hmm. we did, I could understand the logic behind bringing in like 20 a year, yeah. but there's no good reason for that. There's no good reason when there's so many people breeding white tree frogs, there's no good reason to import white tree frogs ever again. Mm-hmm. It's just pure, like pet store greed. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know we don't. I mean, a red eyed tree frog, you know, uh, produces you know a hundred eggs in a clutch on average, mm-hmm. and you could very easily produce ten thousand red eyed tree frogs in a year off of not very many adults. Wow! If you wanted yeah. to, oh yeah, there's yeah. No reason. Mm-hmm. There's no reason to import them, especially knowing that, you know, I bet 80% of the ones imported die. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's sadly true of most of, you know, like I've, I've heard some conflicting, I've heard some, some conflicting, um, some conflicting data on that. Like I, I, I believe it wasn't long ago that I saw some interesting video put out i think it was responsible reptile keepers or something like that on instagram or mm-hmm. responsible yeah they they put out something about there's like that it might be a myth that so many of them die once they get here and i wasn't super i mean convinced. i can tell you from red eyed tree frogs which i see imports frequently like i see imported like shipments of imports and i can tell you a lot of them die oh well, yeah. i mean it, well, it, just it, to, just to clarify on that though that they that that particular thing that they're talking about um, pet in pet homes, what percentage die per year? Oh. So that's, that's like the next stage. Oh, I mean, everything. Uh, but even, too, you know? 
Yeah, right. but I think that, but I think that you're right. Like, this, if we're talking about the numbers of of everything that's coming in, you know, before mm-hmm. it even makes it into a pet home, a pet right. keeper home, right? You're you're gonna have really different numbers, I'm sure. Well, okay. okay, yeah, the worst of it's never even getting there. Why do we still import baby ball pythons? Yeah, that part's yeah. weird. There's yeah. no. Have you been to a reptile show? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, weird. <laughs> yeah. That, that, yeah, no, that part's really weird. You know, there's just things like. Do we really need to import baby blood pythons? Do we need to import like look at retics? I mean, they aren't imported because of the Lasiac stuff, but like, mm-hmm. I mean, nobody wants to tell the truth about why people breed retics. Yes, there are people that truly love their giant, dangerous, really stinky snakes, but for the most part, people breed retics because they drop seventy five freaking eggs in a clutch. Yeah, mm-hmm. they're yeah. doing it to make money. So, well, so, so then this is, this is something I'm really curious. Um, You mentioned this shift needing to be cultural. So what, what is it, it, because how do we, how, how do we set the example that helps drive it? You just think it's an example. example. I mean, what more can you do? You know, preach, preach that gospel and, and, and try to set that example. You know, I struggled with Mm -hmm. this shit. Over and over again, my entire life as a reptile breeder, you know, there's some days where I'm just like, what am I doing? You know, I should just sell all my shit and go move to South Africa or to the Caribbean or something and just look at lizards for the rest of my life in the wild Mm -hmm. and live in a hut. Um, Mm -hmm. But there's just that thing about me that like I do it because I I like the feeling of accomplishment of breeding shit that nobody's ever bred. Mm -hmm. or something that's difficult to breed. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that you have to do it in a way that you can personally look at yourself in the mirror. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I I used to have a different opinion, but now I'm just like, you know what? You need to find your own, you know, compass, your own ethics, and you need to adhere to them. So that's kind of like what I do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there is a struggle, you know, especially being as old as I am and having gone through this hobby and its evolution, you know, but I still fight some urges, you know, um, like, of course I would never do this. Um, but like, yeah, I mean, if I saw Draco come in, I'd be like, God, man, I'd love to get some Draco, you know, but they're going to die. I mean, Mm -hmm. and so they should never be imported Mm -hmm. in the first place. And so, um, you know, I don't know. I think the only way to do it is to do that. And then to push captive bread as much as possible. You know, I'm not anti wild caught. Obviously, I can't. No, we got to get it somehow. But so we can do it in a sustainable, ethical way. Yeah, agree. So, well, so so you meant you just said that you know, like for you know, you were mentioning Draco as an example, and you're saying, oh, okay, we you know, we shouldn't. They're just gonna die, they're gonna die. We shouldn't import them. It's like okay, how do how do we make the distinction between what we should and shouldn't bring in? Because there are going to be things that come up, like. I mean, they have a 40, 40 or 50 year track record, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, those ones for sure. I get like that, Senegal chameleons, you know, flying lizards. Uh, there's just stuff that, you know, mm-hmm. that, you know, it's just the, the track record kind of speaks for itself, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's interesting. Interesting way of uh, looking at, you know, but then it's like, so, Hey, if you're a special, well, listen, so I, no, I was going to say, if you're like a specialist, you know what you're doing. You're willing to dedicate your life and the attention to like you're a centron, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, the, you know, you guys know what you're a centron are? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Amazing yeah, yeah. arboreal so, anteating. Yeah. Iguanids. So, but you know what? When you're a centron come in, it's not a shipment of 250 of them like it is no. in Draco. It's you like, know? Yeah. That's that's the thing, you know. It's it's when Draco come in, there's a shitload of them. Yeah, you know. Yeah, so I don't know. Such yeah. an iconic yeah. lizard, you know. Right. Oh yeah, right. amazing. It's if only we could um we could figure out what they need. You know, all of these right. iconic things like that. Same with Eurocentron. It's like, I mean, I would love it if those if those could be kept more successfully, but. Um, hey, you it's a very both. short list of people that have done it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's very well, few lizards like, as uh, cool as that. I mean, like something that's uh, more near and dear to your heart, Roy, is like mm-hmm. Polychris Pruvianus. Oh, yeah. So I'm going to have to say I had my first Pruvianus 
almost 30 years ago. Wow. Yeah. And I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. <laughs> there was no information about them, whatever, mm-hmm. you know, and I kept them oh, alive yeah, for quite a while. But, you know, it's like I also was breeding Lamanctus, uh, the conehead blizzards, you know, yeah. for absolutely no reason because they were imported for freaking 12 bucks, you know. Yeah. But, yeah, I don't know. It's 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 a tough thing to say, you know, but then it's like personally, I'll just make the decision that I don't need to own Draco. Mm-hmm. Um and then I just choose not to buy them and I can't really control what other people do. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Mm-hmm. Well, so we've, we've, uh, this is an area where I'd like to say, uh, we've done a good job of, of kind of fleshing out some of the things that are maybe not good, not well within herpetoculture. And yeah. as much as I, as much as I love, uh, having a critical frame on things, I'd really like to, talk about some of the stuff that excites you about the current state of herpetoculture and some of the things that you're really looking forward to, you know, and things that give you hope and give you a sense of um, uh, optimism about what we do. So maybe let's just start with one thing, which is what, what at the moment, if, is, if, is there anything right now that excites you the most about herpetoculture, the state of herpetoculture? Um, uh, well, like that cultural shift that we referenced has already happened. I mean, it's starting. Mm-hmm. It's not where it needs to be. But mm-hmm. I mean, so it, it, unfortunately, it's not for the right motives, but that doesn't really matter. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I look at like what I do with newts because I do a lot with newts. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's funny because like gecko people are like, oh, you breed newts and newt people are like, oh, you have geckos. <laughs> yeah. It's okay to walk into the gum at the same time. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, I can tell you that the newt hobby, the caudate hobby is far beyond what I ever thought it could have been. Mm-hmm. Um, I like the fact that people care more about their animals. I like the fact that people, um, are more interested in the environments for their animals uh than they used to be uh that's a big positive for me uh the whole experience is interactive and i think that's something that people you know like i i always tell people like my animals are not pets to me like i don't hold them i don't really interact with animals like that i have a dog but Mm -hmm. i don't really feel any pleasure from interacting with animals like i see people do Uh, Mm -hmm. my animals i treat them more like you would treat a tropical fish tank like that's how I, that's how I have always been with my animals, you know? Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I see a lot of that and I think that's promising and I, I you know, there is some accountability, uh, from the hobby. Although sometimes I think it goes a little too far. Um, what do you, and, like, what do you mean? Can you give me an example or like, a, tell me what you mean by that? Uh, as far as people taking it too far. Uh-huh. Um, I think that people like, apply way too much human emotion to a reptile sometimes. Mm-hmm. And I think that sometimes people are very willing are too willing to attack other people, uh, you know, with their righteousness position. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like I said, I mean, um, there are people I've seen people like downright, just brutally slaughter people online over <laughs> things. And oftentimes uh, it just happens to be people that are attacking someone who is their competition. You know, I see a lot of mm-hmm. that. Yeah, yeah, that happened that, to me. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. You know, for me, like this was a hobby. You know, when I was younger, the people that bred the animals that you breed were your friends. You know, they were they were not like your competition. And mm-hmm. so that's something that I struggle with, and probably always will. Is that mm-hmm. I just don't understand. This, this the state of the hobby and that's why i don't really use social media much um like i kind of can't stand it but it's mm-hmm. like that's just not the way it used to be you know yeah. people used to have even if you weren't friends you at least respected each other and had a common interest and you were cordial sure. um now everybody wants to tear each other down you know and, well, I, think, uh, I think this is one area where two, two of the things that we've 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 mentioned in the show kind of brush up against one another right so on the one hand um, 
we want to have this situation where we were talking earlier about calling out bad behavior and making mm-hmm. sure that we hold people accountable for what they're doing. And there's this desire to like maintain a sense of um, camaraderie and, and mutual respect. And I think there yeah. are times when those two things can brush up against one another because very often um, the kinds of people, the kinds of behaviors that I feel that I have felt compelled to call out have been performed by people who might otherwise be seen as my competition, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I, and, and I have to be like, uh, and so, and so obviously I don't do it in a, in a, in a public way. I don't go out yeah. there and start posting all over the internet, but like, there are lots of people right now who I consider friends who are other Euromastics breeders, but there, and there are other ones who I'm like, look, I'm just not going to, I'm just not going to, um, I'm not going to interact with this person anymore because I don't appreciate what they're doing. I don't think they're doing things yeah. well. And I don't think it's fair to the animals they're keeping or to the people that they're selling to. It's not fair to do those things. And so yeah. that kind of brushes up against it. But I do think the I still find a lot of people who have great regard for people who um, are, are, are doing, doing great things. Like, my goodness, like just this podcast is a great example of that because we've had on so many people from so many different backgrounds and some of the same backgrounds who do n- with, with, with very rare exception, come on here and do nothing but tout the goodness of others and say like, man, these guys are out here killing it. And I, I, I appreciate being able to see this kind of thing. So I still think that's there. I really do. Um, I, I just think that there are more of us who are comfortable with saying like, Hey, this dude's kind of being a jackass. I shouldn't, I wouldn't buy from him if I were you, you know what I mean? Well, I think that there are a lot of bad actors in this hobby that get away with it because mm-hmm. nobody lets other people know like, Hey, that person is going to rip you off. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's maybe there's some shame involved in being, uh, you know, taken advantage of. Mm-hmm. I don't know, but you know, I, I always just tell people, number one, competition is good. I love competition. Yeah. I love that shit. Oh yeah, it's good. So that's number one. I always tell people like if it, it, I don't, I don't know why people consider it a competition when you're just breeding lizards, but they do. But <laughs> I don't consider another person one. I consider that you lost. Like if someone out competes me, it's because I lost. <laughs> that's my perspective. And so, and I always I also tell people like just focus on what you're doing. <laughs> do the and and your your hard work is going to, you know, basically out compete the other person anyway. Uh, and you know, that there's two ways to have like the tallest skyscraper in a skyline. Sure. And you can build the tallest skyscraper or you can tear all the other skyscrapers down so that yours is the tallest. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't, I don't like that kind of stuff at all, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and, and that just seems to be well, social media society, it's all a mess, but, um, I mean, I'm an animal person. I'm not a people person. I didn't get into keeping animals so I could make friends with human beings. Um, (laughs) you know, it's like, it's a very, uh, you're speaking to a foundational problem in our, in our, uh, microculture here. (laughs) It's just, (laughs) I mean, look, I mean, I posted, I think the last time I posted something on Facebook was literally like freaking six years ago or something. And, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I just don't, I'm busy. I have a lot of animals to take care of, mm-hmm. you know? Right. Right. I have a large right. collection of very rare species and I have a large collection of not so rare species because mm-hmm. I like all of them. And mm-hmm. so, and some of them are strictly for me to make money off of, but I only breed what I love. I will never breed something. I don't, that doesn't interest me just to make money. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm just, mm-hmm. I'm not geared that way. I could never do it. Mm-hmm. You know, like large scale breed, like leopard geckos. I could never do that. So, so tell us, uh, tell us like who over the years, who have been some of your like primary influences in herpetoculture? Like who are the people and, and why, like, what about them? And I'm talking about positive influences, right? And maybe it's just a yeah. few, you know? So, yeah. Well, there was one guy who was huge when I was a kid mm-hmm. and his name was Mike Smith. Mm-hmm. And he was an incredible guy. I didn't really realize how incredible of a human being he was until I got older okay. and was in his position. And I used to mm-hmm. go over to his place. I was like a troubled youth. And I would go over to his house and he would just take me in his basement and we would sit there and talk snakes for hours. 
And I'm like, this guy had a hot wife or girlfriend, you know, <laughs> and he's spending a significant amount of his time. Cause man, when you get older, you don't realize that giving someone three hours out of your week is yes, huge. It's huge. Mm-hmm. You know? And it's like, he didn't have kids, but he had a hot wife and he had dogs, you know, and I have kids and for me to give up that kind of time and focus time on one person, that was huge. And yeah, uh, yeah. so he was big, of course. Um, I mean, dude, Philippe was huge. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if it wasn't for Philippe and Vivarium Magazine and his books, like none of us would have what we have. And, yeah, yeah. You know, I uh, it's still surreal to me because I mean I've known Philippe for decades, but you know, like. He was a big one. Um, not and maybe not necessarily specifically Philippe the individual, but what he created was huge. I mean, yeah. Vivarium magazine was a fucking monster. Yeah. People oh, just yeah. don't know, you know? And so that was pretty huge to me. Um, you know, there were some gecko people, you know, when I was younger that were pretty big, some zoo people. But yeah, I mean, I would say the major influence would have to be Philippe, you know? Mm-hmm. So. And that guy, uh, he, he, I feel like he comes up in so many ways and in so many yeah. conversations about so many people. And it's like, man, uh, I, there's never enough good things to say about that man. No, I mean, I see yeah. him. I literally see Philippe probably once a week. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, we live pretty close. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, Bob Mayhew was a big one, uh, recently yeah. passed. Mm-hmm. Um, he was huge. I mean, these guys were like my idols when I was a kid, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So right. absolutely, man. You know what I mean? I, I, I'm so fucking old dude that like, <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't even know how old are you guys? I'm 32 I'm and I'm going to be, I'm 36 babies. Yep. Uh, <laughs> I have a daughter that's 31. So, um, <laughs> so like when I grew up, there was this show called, um, Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom, right? Oh, yeah. I remember. Yeah. I remember that show. That yeah. guy's name was Marlon Perkins. Yeah. And so yeah. that was like a big, huge thing for me, you know. And I actually met him. I was at a military academy in seventh grade and he actually went to that. He was an alumni. Uh, and he had come for some ceremony and I met him and like talked to him and that was pretty crazy. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, just, you know, but as far as like the reptile people that are around, I would say, you know, there was, you know, there's some guys like, uh, an old guy named Joe Burgess. Um, and then, uh, yeah, just, uh, I mean, all those old gecko guys that aren't around anymore, you know? Mm. Mm -hmm. So, but that was back in the day when like some of these guys were characters and everybody was just like kind of okay with it. You just brushed it off. You didn't attack them and try to Mm -hmm. destroy them, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, I mean, I would say Philippe was probably the biggest one. Yeah. 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 Seems to be the case for so many with him. Yeah. Um, So then, so uh, I think this would be a good time to chat about um, like the reptile talks. So can you tell yeah. us a little bit about how the reptile talks came to be and sort of what your goal, what your what the, what the goal is with uh, the reptile talks? Yeah. So, you know, I, I was one day just sitting and thinking like, man, there's, you know, there's IHS, there was mm-hmm. Herpeton and, you know, both are great, mm-hmm. but there's really not anything out there for, I mean, how do I say this without sounding like a, jerk you know but the the like below or, or intermediate hobby mm-hmm. where you know i can sit through a lecture on the most scientific boring shit that anybody's ever sat through and i can mm-hmm. absorb and comprehend everything and but a lot of people are intimidated by that kind of stuff and so, you know, one of the big complaints I always hear from people is like, oh, it's crest geckos. Oh, it's this. It's oh. But we're not really the people like me that are into these other species. I mean, I feel and not intentional, but like we never we've not done our part to introduce 
people into these animals and then to deliver the information in a way that they can absorb. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, I, I look at things like uh, the Reptile Super Show. It's freaking <laughs> massive. Mm-hmm. And um, I look at the people walking around that show. Well, they don't really have anything like that. You know, it used to be that we had herp societies, you know, but those are mostly gone now. Um, and so I thought, you know, we need to do a symposium for that level of, of keepers so that they can like use it as a stepping stone to potentially be interested in paying the, the registration fees for like IHS or, or herpeton and things like that, you know, that next level, right? There's, there's nothing in between like reptiles magazine and IHS. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of like what, that was what kind of like spurred it for me. And then I was Mm -hmm. talking to Rami and then Armin, uh, Kulian at, uh, Herp time. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. so I was like, Hey, let's get together and have a conversation about this. And so my, my main goal was to very specifically, uh, you know, curate speakers, uh, for an intended purpose. And that was to get asses Mm -hmm. and seats, you know? Yeah. Um, and so that's kind of like I said, you know, there's not going to be a Crested Gecko talk. There's not going to be a ball python talk, but yet we're not going to have a scientist from Germany come and show slides of a microscope, uh, you know, cuttings off of a Bavaya's toe pad and counting mm-hmm. growth rings, you know, you know, it's not sure. going to be anything that's that far out there to where people's eyes just glaze over. Yeah. And so, you know, that, that was kind of like where that all came from. And, you know, cause I mean, I'm, I'm 50, I'm frustrated. I'm frustrated with the hobby sometimes, mm-hmm. uh, but the hobby is not going to drive itself. It never has. Mm-hmm. It's always been a certain type of person in a certain segment of the hobby that drives that segment mm-hmm. of the hobby. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like I talked to Armin, you know, I was breeding rare and obscure anoles, you know, almost 30 years ago. Mm-hmm. And it's it's very hard to keep anything like that going by yourself long term. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And what's funny is like a lot of the people that are still around peripherally buying anoles here and there, like people like Nathan Manwaring and some of these other guys I've known forever, you know, but they're they're not driving forces in the in mm-hmm. that part of the hobby. And so that's just the reality of it. You know, they're like Philippe drove the hobby with Vivarium magazine. And yeah. Without people that are taking control of the wheel and steering it, it's not going to happen. So what what can I do? Well, like I don't need to do an IHS style symposium. There's already an IHS, you yeah. know. So it's like, well, if if I'm frustrated that people don't find interest in the types of animals that I find interest in, then maybe what I need to do is show them why I think they're cool. Mm-hmm. What it is about them. Take some of the the intimidation factor away from them. And show them like, hey, they're you know, once you learn how to keep these things, they're not intimidating at all. And mm-hmm. so that was kind of what where it was at. And then just to, to kind of make like more of a fun gathering where, you know, people don't feel like awkward and weird. And, you know, like a lot of these things have these banquets and you sit at a table with five strangers you don't know. And everybody's just kind of sitting there, <laughs> not mm-hmm. interacting at all. And. You know, so, you know, that was it. You know, I wanted to make something. Rami's got his strengths. I have my strengths. Armin has his strengths. He's like a social media freaking, he, the guy's insane. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and so, and he's young and I'm old. Yeah, yeah. And I, think, I think there's a good, you know, there's not enough of that kind of stuff happening anymore either. Mm-hmm. You know, is that people, like I, I love Philippe. I've known him forever. I see him all the time. and it's unfortunate to me that a lot of people in the hobby don't like, he doesn't have the relevance that he should have, Mm -hmm. you know? And part of that is that people are just terminally online with social media and nothing else exists, you know, except, except the influencer that's, you know, shoving that stuff down your, in your face, you know? So, you know, that was kind of part of it just to kind of like have some inclusion Mm -hmm. kind of, not necessarily a sense of community socially, but a sense of community within the hobby and try to kind of get people drawn in so that we can point them in the right, right direction. Because I do believe that setting an example is about the only way that we can turn some of this stuff around because people are automatically going to put up defense the minute you try to approach them 
you know, and it's like, okay, well, I'm no longer going to push. I'm going to go over here and I'm just going to do it this way. And maybe you'll pay attention. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe not, maybe my way is not the right way, but it's the right way for me. Mm -hmm. You know, I think there's a lot of wisdom in that. I mean, it's, I think that on some level that's even, you know, part of the impetus behind Phil and I starting the show, you know, it's just, it's just being, being part of like a proactive front in herpetoculture, you know, like we need to be more proactive. Exactly. Like you said, you, we've been, we've spent so much time being reactive and on the defensive and like we have, we have US ARC, you know, but like they're, they're reactive and defensive yeah. by their nature. And we need yep. another, we need a counterbalance to that. We need well, that something. Falls on us. Exactly. That falls on and our that's, shoulders. Exactly. You know? And so we, I, I really appreciate that as like a, yeah, as like you said, like the driver behind Reptile Talks and it sounds awesome. And yeah, and if, about it. and it's not, yeah. it's a, uh, I think there's a couple, a couple of important things to note, right? One of, one of them being that it's not for profit, right? Definitely not for profit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's everything is for US ARC. Awesome. So, and Amazing. Look, I mean, I have my I have my criticisms, you know, I'll keep them to myself. But the fact is, it's like what you said, Roy, is that US ARC mm-hmm. is what US ARC is. And by its very yeah. nature, as there is nothing for it to be but reactive. Yeah, that's its job. Uh, and not only that, they don't have enough manpower. They don't have enough uh. of a support. Uh, you know, uh, to be able to do anything but that. But in, yeah. and, and people can have their negative critiques about US ARC. Some of them I understand. Some of them I'm like, whoa, whoa, hold on a second. Do you realize like US ARC sued US Fish and Wildlife and won? Mm-hmm. That's pretty big. Mm-hmm. Yeah. For a small reptile lobbying group. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The, the weight of Huge. the federal government is intense. Yeah. And so <laughs> uh, to do that, I mean, they single-handedly allowed me to be able to cross state lines with newts and salamanders again. Mm-hmm. You know? So, I mean, that was pretty big. Yeah. And yeah. so, you know, I think, and I think a lot of it came because I just, I'm getting older, my kids, I mean, I, I want to do things to where I, I want to put out my information my way on my terms, mm-hmm. you know, like, like me and Armin have been starting a, uh, a YouTube channel that's going to go under his thing. Uh, but none of the episodes are published, but it's like our experience, like my experience with different species is pretty massive. I mean, I've bred hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of really rare and obscure species and there's no information out there. You know, I look on there like, you know, I bred everything from Suriname toads to New Zealand, green geckos to, I mean, I couldn't even tell you how much stuff I've bred. And Mm -hmm. I look up, there's no good information out there. And uh, rather than get frustrated with some of the stuff that I see on YouTube and the people I see on YouTube, I'm just like, we're just going to go our own way. And that was kind of like the thing with the reptile talks too. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, um, you see the speaker lineup. Uh, I would say all the people that were chosen uh, are, you know, top tier people in their respective areas. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, and of course, Bill was like the number one guy. Like he was already loaded in the chamber, you know, because <laughs> what happened with, you know, what happened with the second herpeton, you know, it's just like mm-hmm. he, he was automatic. So. Yeah. Man, I'm, I'm nervous as shit now. Why? <laughs> I don't know. I just feel like I'm going to go out there, just put my foot in my mouth somehow. <laughs> Perfect. Hey, dude, we're all just real people, man. Yeah. 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 Yeah, you know, yeah, I, okay. I gave I gave my I don't like speaking in front of people, and I've mm-hmm. done it too much now. And um, I'm a very private person. I like to be left alone. I'm an introvert. I wish when I go to restaurants, I I sit in a against the wall in the darkest part with my, of course, facing the door, no matter what. Uh-huh. And, yeah, for, uh, for sure. <laughs> and uh, yeah. I just do it because I have the information in my head. And I'm, you know, I, it needs to be out there. And that was a, a big regret of mine in my youth, you know, looking back now is that I wish that I would have not been quite as private as I was mm-hmm. mm. and allowed other people to kind of control the narrative of a lot of stuff. But then mm-hmm. again, like uh, the last thing I would ever want to be is like some pompous, arrogant, you know, 
Instagram or YouTube famous person, you know? Yeah. I don't, I don't like notoriety. <laughs> I like animals. I spend 90% of my, t- my life alone with animals. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. For sure. Know? Yeah. And, sure. uh, but no, so, I mean, it's cool. It'll be great. Uh, it's affordable, which I think was important. Yeah. Uh, getting rid of the banquet cut the cost in half. Uh, yeah. But yeah. No, it's just really, it's for the hobby and it's for us arc, you know, and we're going to do that publication and mm-hmm. we're selling ad space in the publication. Mm-hmm. Uh, cool. But everything that's above the cost of print is a donation to us arc. You know, Rami's a board member. Yeah. Um, you know, so mm-hmm. yeah, it'll be good. They need money. Yeah, yeah, of they course. Do. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. They may be reactive, but man, they're the only thing we got. Yeah, yeah, for yeah, sure. They, yeah, that's they're still necessary. You know, it's Absolutely. like it's just it's just it's 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 like it's it's one it's one prong of what needs to be a two prong right. approach. Right now, they're doing all of it. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Well, that's like well, I said. It's on us as yeah. as hobbyists as a community to set a standard. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Of yeah. course. We shouldn't Absolutely. expect US Art to do all the heavy lifting. No. Right. And a lot of people do. And it's like, yeah. well, all the complaining that you're doing, but like, what proactive thing are you doing? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah. Put your money, put your money where your mouth is. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Well, what's what's next for you? Like just you personally. What do you what do you have coming down the, the pike? Uh, other I mean, than that. My number oh, yeah, my I focus mean, my focus <laughs> at this point in my life is to really do my part to work with the species that I like and the species that I like that have commercial viability to really try to elevate my production on those. So like I mentioned firebelly toads, right? My intention is to produce like 15 to 20,000 firebelly toads a year. Mm. And, you know, I breed a lot of newts and salamanders, but I, I also breed other things, but I don't, I don't, have to rely on rare species to pay bills, mm-hmm. nor do I want to. Um, so I feel like if I can put captive bred alternatives into the pet trade so that wild caught animals don't have to be the sole supply source, then, mm-hmm. then I can sleep well at night, you know? And then mm-hmm. also just to kind of put the information I have out there so that there's a reference guide, whether it's, uh, you know, audio, visual, both, whatever. You know, mm-hmm. I, I might mm-hmm. actually start doing the book thing. I've I've talked about it for years, but it's just I'm very busy. You yeah, know, sure. it's a lot of I got time. A lot of animals to take care of, and you know, the Southern California dating scene is. <laughs> you know, so, uh, <laughs> but yeah, you know, I mean, um, you know, that's that's it. Just uh, you know, I, I'm. I'm not stupid. You know, I see, you know, I'm leaning into some collaborative stuff with Armin just because mm-hmm. yeah, as you guys know, the guy is highly qualified. He's, he's a wizard. Oh yeah. He yeah. Is. Yeah. I mean, the guy's like, the guy's got like almost a half a million Instagram followers now. I'm like, yeah. He's shredding. Him. Yeah. He's doing it, man. And he's really good with his, you know, he's, he went to school for like what documentary filmmaking. Mm-hmm. So, you know, he's got the eye. So, you know, he's young. And he's mm-hmm. uh, far more experienced at anything to do with any type of uh, technology than I am. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it, you know, I can help him and he can help me. But yeah, mm-hmm. just putting it out there. Legacy for my kids. Mm-hmm. Stuff like that. You know, my kids are number one to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Man. Well, number That's two. Awesome. Number one next to animals. <laughs> <laughs> just, number yeah. one in the human world. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, you know, don't make me yeah. choose, kids. <laughs> uh, don't give me an ultimatum. Um, but uh yeah, I mean just that, just trying to promote what I think is uh you know, the right ethical, you know, trajectory for me personally and for the hobby. You yeah. know, I mean it's like uh I just I you you know, I'm going to get into this in my talk for mm-hmm. the reptile talks, you know. Uh, I've just seen so many species come and go and what was the point of it all? You know, mm-hmm. what really, what was the point of it all? And yeah. I understand that people want to have pets. I'm here for it. But you know, if I can, if I can produce 
um, most people with amphibians just because the amphibians are high producers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if I can do that kind of stuff, I've never liked the term conservation through captive breeding. Mm -hmm. I've just never liked that term yeah. because I think that's cope. I think a yeah, lot of yeah. people use that as a coping a phrase to kind of like compartmentalize yeah. and, and validate why they put an animal in a glass cube. Yeah. Like it's for some benevolent reason. And it's okay to just be like, you know what? I like to keep animals in glass cubes, and but I'm going to mm -hmm. do it in a way that I think it does right by the animal. Totally. Yeah. You know, and yeah. it's, that's this thing that people try to like maneuver through all this stuff. And, and it's just like, just be honest. It's like, you know, like when mm -hmm. I grew up in the Midwest, people would go hunting. I'm not a hunter. I don't want to shoot mm -hmm. Bambi in the face, but like, mm -hmm. don't bullshit me and say you do it to feed your family. When you live in a half a million dollar house and you own a truck, you own a truck that sits in a driveway, you know, 50 weekends out of the year, mm -hmm. you know, and you have, you know, the amount of money you spend on your gun and your boots and your fake deer urine and all that other stuff, you can buy <laughs> meat for, for five years. So yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's okay to just, you know, do things the right way or at least do your best. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, totally. For sure, man. Well, well, yeah, it looks like we're coming up on about an hour and a half now. And as you said, and we, as we know, you're a very busy man. So and you have tonsillitis. I feel like we should move, move toward closing. Yeah. It's true. And you have tonsillitis, apparently. <coughs> I do. <laughs> yeah, white so, spots and everything. Oh, uh, man. All right. Well, let's, let's, let's move towards our closer. And, and, um, I think that I feel like this is a, feels like another episode where it just feels like it's kind of introductory and hopefully at some point we can have you on again yeah, and we definitely. can get into more depth, can, but yeah, we can deep dive into some species stuff, you know, oh, that'd I'd be be great. Really, I'd love to do that. Yeah. And I guess I'm really going to see you guys. Too. I'm going to see both of you in like yeah. three yeah. weeks. That's right. Yeah, yeah. We'll both be there. Yep. I'm looking cool. forward to it. Hell so, yeah. It's going to be super fun. Uh, Roy, have you ever been to that show? No, I've never been to any of the oh. super shows, so oh, I'm amped. Are, you guys are gonna shit. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna be crazy. <laughs> it's a, I'm, it's, I'm, uh, I'm bracing myself. It's a really big show. Yeah, it's gonna be nuts. Yeah. Can't wait. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, our our closing question that we do with every guest is why herpetoculture, and that could be why herpetoculture. Why do you do it? Why do we do it? Why does it matter? However you want to answer that question. Uh, I have no answer for that because I really don't know why. <laughs> it's, it's <laughs> I like, appreciate it, man. It's like an instinctual <laughs> uh, like obsession. You know, I, 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 yeah. I eat it, breathe it, sleep it. My, I, I don't remember it not being like the number one thing in my life. You know, like, yeah. I mean, I will, I will tell you that reptiles and amphibians would like legitimately saved my life probably mm -hmm. you know i mean i was in a lot of trouble i i should be dead or in prison mm -hmm. and my focus my shift to focus on reptiles definitely pulled me out of that stuff mm -hmm. yeah and so uh but that's not why i mean there was already a deeply ingrained uh you know inexplainable obsession and it's just been that way ever since I was a little kid. You know, I'm just fascinated by all reptiles and amphibians. You know, it's like why I can't keep just snakes or just lizards or just turtles or whatever. I have to keep, a, you know, a variety of these things. But yeah, I don't know why. I don't know why. I mean, but it's, it's, it's what drives me in life. Yeah. yeah. Everything else is second. Mm-hmm. You know? I think, yeah, because they're awesome. I think that's the, that's they the right awesome. answer. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, people like they're my friends. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I can't explain Even it I either. Don't, I don't interact with them like that, you know, yeah. but sure. I mean, I, I have to say that. Otherwise, I sound like I'm some lonely, like a <laughs> hermit, you know, some pathetic, lonely fucking hermit. <laughs> yeah. No, nah, man, I get it. I get it. They're good company. Well, you know? I mean, look. They have given me so, like, I never thought at the age of 17, 16, 15, how could I possibly know that I would basically have friends in almost every country on the planet? Mm -hmm. I mean, how, yeah. how would I know that the amount of traveling that I've done, 
I never would have traveled if it weren't for reptiles. Because you're not going to yeah. catch me dead on a fucking Alaskan cruise. It's just never going <laughs> to And so, uh, I mean, there's just a lot that it's given me. I mean, the friend, I, even though I don't do it for social interaction, the friendships mm-hmm. that I've had because of that are, they're a much stronger bond than most people's friendships. Like the guys mm-hmm. that like, go watch uh, football games together or play fantasy football or that kind of crap. You know? <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, like the friendships that you have in this uh, hobby are mm-hmm. visceral. Yeah. The, the connection is much stronger than any type of friendship connection that most people have. Mm-hmm, so I will yeah. say that, you know, even though I keep my friendship circle really small, I have really good friends because of mm-hmm. reptiles. Yeah. Oh, you yeah know? For sure, but, man. But Amen why? That. I don't know why. <laughs> that's good, man. I appreciate it. I appreciate the candor. Yeah. I don't think I can wrap my head around it. Do you know that's why? Probably, that's probably the most honest answer we've had to that question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. I mean, I've got, like you, I've got all kinds of, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't know why, because it predated all the reasons why I could really make sense of it. In the same way that you said it, you know, it's like, I don't remember a time when I wasn't obsessed with reptiles. You know, I Dude, came I'm out 50 of 50 years old. Room. I'm 50 years old. I can still remember my, the first time I ever saw a green snake in a rough green snake in the wild. Mm-hmm. You know, I can remember the first time I ever saw like my first garter snake. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I mean, and I was young. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Really young. I remember the first time I ever saw like a timber rattlesnake. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, it's like I can remember like it was yesterday. Yeah. So I didn't, yeah. yeah my, I mean, my- my earliest childhood memory is is um, coming home from a, a reptile show at the Sonoma County Fairgrounds with a, a desert phase California king snake in a deli cup with aspen shavings. Mm-hmm. That's the earliest traceable memory for me. Dude, I mean, coming from the Midwest, like a 50-50 cow king mm-hmm. is like about as exotic as any animal could ever be to me. Mm -hmm. same with alligator lizards i mean growing up and looking in like seventh field guide and then like every time i see and i've seen a lot of fucking alligator lizards now (laughs) i mean they're everywhere but yeah every time they're still awesome yeah i'm just like it could be as exotic as a knob-tailed gecko to me yeah and the same thing goes for cow kings you know like Mm -hmm. i see a cow king and i'm like god like it was, it, it may as well have been, you know, from another country living in, you know, oh, growing yeah. up in Kansas City. So, oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm still into it, man. And I go yeah. herping a lot, not as much as like I, I wish I could go herping more. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, dude, it's, it's, it's an obsession. For mm-hmm. sure, man. That doesn't need to be explained. So don't ask me why. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. That's it. I think we should close it right there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We can't yeah. top of that. That's the right. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hit the button. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Hang on. <laughs>